Back when I first started making podcasts, back even before the now venerable GM Word of the Week, I had no idea what I was doing, which seems like an obvious thing to say. Of course you didn't know what you were doing, you'd never done it before, you might say, and you'd be right. Unfortunately, I knew I didn't know what I was doing, yet somehow that didn't prevent me from wanting to do it anyway because there are those who will look at a thing they really want to do, realize they know nothing about it, and then give up almost immediately. It's like the first filter to see if you are really serious about taking an interest in something. Can you look at an unknown, realize how much work you're going to have to do to even begin, let alone get good at it, and then still want to carry on doing that thing? If the answer is, no, I can't be bothered learning all that, then thank you for your interest, but please find something else to do. Since I was definitely in the yes please camp when it came to podcasting, it meant I had a lot of work to do before eventually arriving at the show you are now listening to. Fortunately, I had a bit of help ready to hand when I began, although those many years ago. I'd made the acquaintance of some fine folks willing to share what they already knew and took to producing short audio segments for their podcast. This let me learn a bit about audio and script production and got me familiar with the basic software and equipment needed to produce such segments. The very basic equipment in some cases. If you go looking, you can find those early efforts under the title of Stormtrooper Poetry and hear for yourself how audio sounds when recorded with a USB microphone intended for the game SingStar which I found for $10 at a pawn shop. At least it was made by Sony. Progress was painful and occurred only a little at a time. But as time went on, I discovered more and more about what I was doing and how I was meant to do it and what the technical limits were of the equipment I was using. Eventually, I became confident enough in my basic competency to invite a friend to make a full-fledged podcast of our own And so we turned out a podcast called Game On, where we talked about board games and such, for the same D20 radio network at which I had apprenticed reasonably successfully earlier. And what followed from there were podcasts with friends about Star Wars stuff called The Holocron, gaming advice for the budding role-playing game GMs called Pottlebat, a live play podcast called Pottlebat Yelp, the weird news podcast I Can't Hear You, the Skill Monkey segment for Star Wars GMs to help them understand the funky dice, and then came the very podcast you are listening to now, and a further TWGT-style podcast called Digressions and Dragons, which at least once every few months someone writes in to say they just discovered and already miss it terribly. Which is nice to hear. All along the way, incremental steps were taken, not only in learning what it takes to make a podcast, but also what it takes to make a successful one, which are two different things, in case you weren't quite sure. Upgrades were made to equipment over the years from a starting point of I have none to where I am now, which is so content with the current setup that I haven't felt the need to improve it for several years now. Software was likewise improved upon, which, much to my surprise, made an almost immediate difference, even though I had to learn a whole new system to make it all work. Turns out the free stuff is all well and good to get started with and can get you well on the road, but the step up to prosumer software makes a heck of a difference just in terms of sound quality alone. On top of all that, there was learning to write a script that people would listen to for any length of time, learning to deliver the script in a way that people wanted to listen to, discovering how to add music, and then discovering how to add music that didn't annoy everyone. I learned website design, figured out file storage solutions, learned about RSS feeds and how to use them, got used to self-promotion well enough to do it every once in a while, and thereby figured out how to fund something that was no longer an idle hobby, but was increasingly like an almost actual job. Visit buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback to help support the show and me. I learned how to get an episode out in the face of not one, but at least three near disasters, two of which involved fire and one of which involved my father. He's much better now, 
thank you. And that's not even to mention troubleshooting years of terrible internet connections that would have me offline every few days in the summer until the equipment at the ISP cooled back down and, at one point, took me offline for six months because the one guy running the whole system in his garage died. And no one thought to mention it to any of the customers. All of which is to say that putting out a podcast is way more than just recording your voice and getting all your friends to listen to it. There's lots to know, just as it relates to making something you can get people to listen to, and then lots more to know about getting it out there to where they can listen to it, and then even more to know about all the things that can go wrong that you can plan for, and things that go wrong that are a total surprise even to people who have been at it for years already. Not to mention all the things that can go right that bring their own sorts of problems. It is a heck of a steep learning curve. Except it isn't. Because no one uses the phrase steep learning curve correctly. And while I'm explaining that, why not head over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback and become a member. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Remember, please, if you will, in the last episode when we were talking about Skinner boxes, or rather, operant conditioning boxes, I mentioned a psychologist by the name of Edward Thorndike, and how his effort to see if cats could teach each other to escape from puzzle boxes not only taught us that cats absolutely refuse to learn anything from anyone, including each other, but also showed that the time it took cats and other animals to learn to escape the box on their own could be plotted on a graph, and that this graph came to be called a learning curve. Every animal has one, and not just for escaping from boxes, but for learning how to do almost everything an animal has to do that isn't automatic or instinctual. Breathing doesn't really have a learning curve. You either know how to do it already, or immediately flunk out of life. Thorndike discovered that some consequences strengthened behaviors, and some consequences weakened behavior, and that this interplay of behaviors and consequences was what made up an animal's learning curve. The more a behavior led to quote-unquote good consequences, the more they were likely to be repeated, and those that led to quote-unquote bad consequences were less likely to be repeated. In this way, an animal would learn how to be successful at a given task, say, escaping from one of Thorndike's boxes. The important point of the whole thing, though, was that for most animals, it is more or less a case of random behaviors leading to consistent consequences that paves the way for learning. See, if the consequences aren't consistent, if the consequence for running into a wall isn't always, ow, my head hurts, that makes it much more difficult for an animal to determine which behaviors work and which ones don't. If I only sometimes get a mild electrical shock for pressing the red button, it is much more difficult for me to learn that pressing the red button is a bad thing, especially if sometimes the red button actually does drop a tasty treat down into my bowl for me to enjoy. This is why when it comes to training your dog, the most important thing every trainer will tell you, above almost everything else, is to be consistent. Say you want your dog not to climb on the furniture. In order to train that, you have to make sure that every time the dog even tries to climb on the couch, they get shooed off it right away. No hanging around half on and half off. No sometimes inviting them up after everyone else has gone to bed. Not even a special chair they can climb into because no one else ever sits on it. If you want your dog to stay off the furniture, you have to consistently train it not to ever go on. The biggest problem most professional dog trainers have to deal with isn't the dogs. It is inconsistent owners who expect their animals to learn all the subtle nuances and special cases about when they can and can't do something depending on things like who is present, where they are, what time of day it is, what mood their owner is in, and a whole host of other factors that do nothing but confuse the animal and slow down the learning process. Consistent consequences are a must. So, 
Once Thorndyke had his puzzle box properly set up and the learning environment was able to consistently dole out consequences both good and bad, he was able to plot over the course of numerous attempts how long it took his cats to get out of the box. And then he could compare that plot of results to the results from other cats to determine that no, they didn't learn from watching each other, and then compare the results to other animals to learn that there were far quicker learners in the animal kingdom than the local increasingly irritated felines. This, then, was the learning curve. And what he got was a learning curve that started out very shallow and flat, and then gradually rose very slowly as time went on. As the cats engaged in more behaviors and encountered the various consequences of those behaviors, they slowly learned which ones to avoid and which ones to repeat in order to get out of the box, until eventually they were escaping the box as quickly as they were ever going to, and no subsequent attempts would happen any faster than those that came before. The learning plateaued, and the learning curve leveled off. And if you followed along carefully, you now see why the phrase, a steep learning curve, which we use to indicate something that's really difficult to learn, is the wrong way around. You want a steep learning curve. Steep means that you are rapidly learning the things you need to learn as quickly as you possibly can. You are learning a lot all at once and you are using it to be more and more successful much more quickly on each subsequent attempt before you hit the plateau, which means you've learned all you can for now and no further improvement will be made. The really difficult tasks that are really tough to learn have learning curves that are very nearly flat with no upward trend at all. They're almost all plateau right from the start. The most you can do is make very tiny incremental rises over long periods of time. The proper phrase should be, if we were using it correctly, this thing has a really shallow learning curve. But the whole process of learning and the learning curve makes one very important assumption. And it is this assumption that tells us what to do when our learning hits a plateau. See, the learning curve, as is the case with cats especially, assumes that all the learning has to be done by a single individual in isolation. No cat is going to help any other cat learn how to get out of the box. Cats just don't work like that. That's not how a cat learns, nor is it how very many other animals learn. But there are a few animals, some of the more intelligent ones, that can beat the plateau because they have learned how to learn from each other. And that's the secret to beating the learning plateau, learning from other individuals who have gone before you. By using their knowledge in place of your own, you can continue to enjoy a very steep learning curve indeed. And the steeper that curve is, the more and more quickly you are learning. There are upper limits, though. At some point, the learning curve stops being all about learning and becomes more about efficiency. Look at it this way. In the beginning of learning something, you don't even know what to do or what there is to learn. It's all basically a mystery. So you begin by surveying the scope of the field. What will I need to know in order to do the thing I want to do? What resources, materials, tools, or knowledge do I need in order to even begin? You don't know, but you start to find out. Then, as you continue learning about your area of interest, you begin to put these pieces together. You make many mistakes and get things wrong, but by learning from your mistakes, you can begin to piece together a process by which you can accomplish your goal. As you learn more, you begin refining that process so that further errors are minimized. As errors are minimized, you can begin to see where parts of the process can be streamlined and made easier. And you continue iterating on your process until you are making very few errors at all. At that point, the task becomes more about increasing efficiency, less wasted motion, materials, or time, than it does about learning how to do the thing you are doing. 
Learning new techniques can increase efficiency, but eventually you're going to learn all the techniques there are, and you will be as efficient as you ever will be. You'll be performing at the top of your field, and your learning curve will have leveled off into a plateau. A successful plateau, one hopes, but an unavoidable one nonetheless. Of course, the reason we use steep learning curve incorrectly is because to look at a charted learning curve, it looks like an ascending hill. And we all know how difficult it is to walk uphill. So obviously going up a learning curve is a harder activity. It must be, and therefore the phrase makes total sense the wrong way around. But of course, we can learn to do it differently. However shallow that particular learning curve might be. And now that we've cleared up the confusion over learning curves, we can talk about where you might run into them most often, except that they go under an entirely different name. In the world of video games, they're called difficulty curves, and perhaps no company better understands the use of difficulty curves than from software. Originally founded in 1986 because Natoshi Zin needed something to do with all the insurance money he'd received as a settlement in a motorcycle accident, from software started out by making some of the hardest computer software out there. Business software. Specifically, agricultural business software. You know, like working out the logistics of managing pig feed. That sort of thing. At the time, games were very hard to make. Not that they've gotten much easier. But part of the difficulty in 1987 was that the size of the code needed to make the game had to fit on a cartridge and there wasn't really a way to make a game larger or more complicated than what could be stored on those cartridges. Fortunately, just as the 90s hit, and Japan faced an economic turndown like the rest of the world, the Sony PlayStation came out and showed the world, and from software, what could be done with compact discs. Facing a choice between going out of business making business software, and taking a chance on developing games, from software elected to try its hand at gaming. Their first game was Kingsfield. Released as a launch title for the first PlayStation, Kingsfield was a first-person 3D role-playing game set in a vast underground labyrinth beneath a shrine. The convoluted plot involves rivals for the crown, betrayals, corrupted souls, and a general sense of despair because of how hard the thing was to play. The player character had a stamina meter, and nothing, not fighting, not magic, not even movement, could occur if the stamina meter didn't have some stamina in it. Every action gradually used up the meter, and the player would have to wait for it to refill before anything could be done if it ran out. For many gamers, this proved an insurmountable obstacle to enjoying the already complicated game. In fact, it was so hard to play that initial sales made the whole pivot to games look like a terrible decision for From Software. It looked as if they weren't even going to sell enough copies to cover costs. But then, thanks to word of mouth and heavy advertising in magazines of the day, sales picked up and Kingsfield eventually sold 200,000 copies. Enough to double From Software's projections for the title. Still, as with more recent From Software titles, people really didn't like the game, finding it too hard to both understand and actually play, with comments and reviews ranging from slow and unrewarding combat thanks to the stamina meter and its effects, to an experience that would leave the gamer frustrated on one level or another, because of the game's overall complexity and its difficulty curve. It required skills that few gamers to that point had needed. Fortunately, once the game caught on, From Software was able to get out a pair of sequels in short order and build on the success of Kingsfield, whose design would go on to influence the rest of the From Software catalog, particularly in its much later Souls series. Demon Souls was and is one of the more difficult video games to play. They've designed it that way on purpose. Set in a dark fantasy world, you, the player, venture forth to confront a Lovecraft-inspired Old One. And, since in the Lovecraftian lore, Old Ones can only be made to sleep for a time and are unkillable, well, you've more or less set the tone for the entire game right there. 
What makes Demon's Souls so difficult is that it holds the first-time player's hand not at all. Basically, it thrusts you into the world all by yourself and expects you to work out how best to play the game. In fact, it expects you to die repeatedly, and by dying and retrying and dying and retrying and continuing this process over and over again, you're meant to gradually learn what does and doesn't work against the game's various weird, creepy, and dare we say eldritch, monsters and bosses. It expects you to make slow progress in the game in order to eventually beat it. Demon Souls and all subsequent games in this series, and most of the rest of From Software's library of titles, are the very definition of a steep learning curve. Even though you now know better than to call it that. But those games also point out one other thing. See, many people, upon picking up a Souls game for the first time, think that the games are particularly unbalanced, even broken. Enemies are too tough for how little your character improves as you play the game. Progress is minute and a long time in coming, and the game doesn't let up the closer you get to the end. It stays just as difficult as it was when you began. For many people, they are just too tough to even bother playing, and they wouldn't enjoy the process even if they did play. From Software, however, has a different view, and that view is that the games are balanced. They're some of the most carefully balanced games in existence. They're just balanced towards the difficult end of the seesaw, rather than somewhere in the middle, like most other games. Their difficulty curve is intentionally shallow, and fans of the games love them for it. But lots of popular entertainments have particularly difficult learning curves. Music requires you to learn to sing or play instruments. Novels and other written works require that you have some command of the language and can use it well. Even the lowly podcast, as mentioned, has things that must be learned if you intend to make a good one. But perhaps the most difficult entertainment to learn to do well is the creation of movies and television shows. Not only will you likely need an acting class or two just to get started if you're going to be in front of the camera, but behind the camera are a whole host of specialists who have to be masters of their craft. From directors to set decorators, lighting techs to special effects experts, the whole TV and movie industry is full of nothing but people who have spent time making incremental progress along their own learning curves and perfecting or striving to perfect their particular contributions to the process. Which is why it is not uncommon to find someone in any production who has made a mistake. Heck, finding just one is something of a blessing considering how many people are involved on all levels. Just one would be a miracle. The TV series Downton Abbey was a British historical drama set between 1912 and 1926. It was created by Julian Fellows, and the first series aired on ITV in 2010. It depicts the lives of the Crawley family and their servants and other associates as they cope with life in Britain as the British social structure is beginning to change thanks to numerous events like World War I and the outbreak of the Spanish flu. The series opens with the sinking of the Titanic and the effects it has on the male hereditary line of the Crawley family. Matthew Crawley, middle-class lawyer, unexpectedly finds himself the next heir to what remains of the Crawley fortune and estate, Downton Abbey. The problem is, Matthew Crawley wants almost nothing to do with the traditional aristocratic lifestyle, and this causes no end of difficulty for those already installed at the Abbey. He clashes with almost everyone and runs into problems everywhere. The first series runs for seven episodes, and over the course of the episodes, everyone is forced to adjust to a new way of doing things and the style of life this entails. Eventually, as series three of the show comes to a conclusion in 1920, Matthew Crawley, played by the actor Dan Stevens, is forced to admit that he too has had to learn a few things along the way, and that as the owner of the estate, he's been on a steep learning curve since arriving at Downton. Which, of course, is all wrong. Not because he used the word steep to describe the difficulty of learning how things work at Downton, but because the phrase steep learning curve, 
as famous language pedant Ben Zimmer pointed out at the time, wasn't in use outside the circles of psychology, and wouldn't be for at least another two years. Writer Julian Fellows had made an error. But that's okay, because the chief attraction of a series like Downton Abbey isn't in the accuracy of its phrases, but rather in the glimpse it offers into a time long past and what it was like to live in that place at that time as the world was changing. And of course, any time a time and place changes, no matter how it changes or why, there will be people who remember the way things used to be fondly whether it was really like that or not. Their memories and imaginations will tell them it was way better then than it is now. Which means that one of the other attractions of a series like Downton Abbey is nostalgia. Thank you for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. Your patience and loyalty are appreciated. Unless, of course, this is your first time listening, in which case, thank you for giving it a listen. I hope you found it interesting and informative and didn't forget to subscribe. 2022 has been a rough year for a variety of reasons, not all of which make sense, but many of which meant you didn't get to hear episodes on anything like a regular basis. To be honest, I burned out a bit in the middle there and had a heck of a time getting restarted. It's been a long six years of nearly weekly production for the regular show, plus all the bonuses and extras I was responsible for as part of the efforts to keep the show funded and attract new supporters. Well, frankly, it was all a bit much, and I began to have doubts about how I was spending my time and question why it was I didn't feel very good about any of the things I was doing and the effort going into it for what felt like not much reward. So, after a long, self-imposed break in the middle of the year and a much slowed episode release while I thought about options, the solution became somewhat obvious. Focus on the core. Gone are the bonus episodes for backers, gone are the live chats, and hopefully gone is the super poor time management that meant I was basically constantly in production on the next episode every single day of the year. I need to get out more because we've all been ridiculously cooped up for a couple years now, and that takes a toll. And I need to be able to get out without feeling as if I'm screwing up my release schedule every time I step out for a few hours. Those points, and others, are hopefully going to make a difference. That said, with a return to the core of the show and making episodes the priority, you will hear more of them in 2023, and on a better, more regular schedule. What that schedule will be, though, is still up in the air. I'm going to ease back into things and see where I land in the coming year. There's a lot of words yet to cover and a lot of ways to cover them, but I'm not going to place particular expectations on myself to do things one way or another. I'm a company of one. So I get to decide how it all works out. But that also means that if something goes wrong... There's no one else to pick up the slack. I have to be careful about that. So there's your end of the year update. Thank you for your patience and understanding where applicable. I hope you know that your support, whether that is financial, social, or just plain old good wishes, is much appreciated. Hopefully, you continue to find it worthwhile. Thank you kindly. This episode is a Fiddleback production and was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Find more episodes at gmwordoftheweek.com and follow the show on Twitter at gmwotw. You can help support the show at buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback with both one-time and ongoing pledges. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions, home of minimalistic acoustic music for production and pleasure. 
visit them at sessions.blue. I've had maybe 20 jobs, big and small, and I've never hated any of them. At the same time, the moment the learning curve flattened, I was out of there. 